Here we go. It's January the 12th in the year of our Lord, 2023. You're listening to Rumination Thursday, Law and Gospel. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and with me on Thursday, first time this year, we're back with Pastor Wes Reimnitz. Good morning, Wes. Good morning, Tom. It's quite, uh, we're halfway through the month already. I know. I mentioned that to my wife. We better start getting ready for Christmas. <laughs> well, Christmas is every day. I tell you, th- these years are going by so fast. It's just really amazing. But we'll see. We've got some items we're going to be talking about. Uh, one of them is a survey that was talking about by reading dropped dramatically in 2022. In uh, previous years, 2021 to 2020, roughly 50% of American adults reported opening scripture at least three times in every year. But then in 2022, the number declined to 39%. Now, what reasons do they give for that? Well, they wish that they could read the Bible more, creating opportunities, but uh, uh, I think they got caught up with other things going on. Uh, And they mentioned record inflation, threats of nuclear war in the Russia Ukraine conflict, ongoing debates about the state of democracy, and of course, COVID. Now, I I can't figure out why threats of nuclear war in the Russian Ukraine conflict had people stop from reading their Bible. Do you? No, but you know, you know what it reminds me of? No. The Old Testament. In, in numbers, where the twelve spies went into Cana, yes. and they came back to report it was a land of milk and honey, but uh, ten of them said, "Oh, it's disastrous, fortified city, uh, terrible things going on there," and there were only two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who said, "We can do it with with the Lord's guidance." So God sent them back into the wilderness another 38 years so that all those who refused to go in at a certain age died, and it was their children and grandchildren that ended up going into the land of Canaan finally. In fact, uh, it even reports there in Joshua that uh, or uh, numbers that only Joshua and Caleb were going to be that generation that was going to be allowed into the land. It would be the children right. uh, of those. Now it says 61% don't read the Bible, 39% do read the Bible, and, and then of that 39%, they kind of divided them up as to how they read the Bible. Did you get that? Uh, read it or read it more, creating an opportunity to invite neighbors to a deeper engagement with God's Word. Yes. And they said that, believe it or not, younger people in particular say they are drawn to Bible reading plans and Bible studies that look at whole chapters or complete stories. Like, we're doing the entire book of Proverbs on Wednesday, kind of going through that. It says 11% listen to the Bible on a podcast, and that could be like listening to programs on KFUO. 18% read the Bible online, 27% read the Bible in print, and 19% read the Bible on an app. So it does look like that many people use their computers uh, to, to read the Bible and to study it. But 
Can you think of any other reason why people maybe have stopped reading the Bible? I think they've, they've filled up their lives with many other things. I mean, again, back to that numbers thing. Uh, with, with the 12 spies, 10 just couldn't see the end of, end of the thing. And they had forgotten how God had acted in their lives, delivering them out of Egypt, taking them through the the waters of the Red Sea you know, to dry land, right. uh, delivered them from Pharaoh. They were delivered in many ways. They had a pillar of fire and a column of smoke to a clouds to, to to lead them to the wilderness. They were fed with manna. They, in, in other words, there are so many things that they could see God actively working in their lives. And I, do, I think they got lost somehow with, with, with them that uh, they no longer read the Bible today. Well, the best example of how people get lost is Adam and Eve. Talk about being yeah. in a perfect place, the Garden of Eden. And yet they threw that all out simply by thinking that they could become like God, which is always the problem behind every sin. You're really trying to become like God. And so a lot of people make up their own God, and that's why they don't read the Bible. And then a lot of them attend churches where they really don't get the kind of comfort from a long gospel point of view Uh, during the pandemic, for example, and therefore they stop reading the Bible because they're not getting comfort in their churches, which leads to another article about a third of Americans have stopped going to church. What's that article about? Well, they ran across some surveys that that they'd done uh, about uh, people not going to church during the pandemic, I, and I've seen that too. But what's what's interesting about this is uh, they talk about the pandemic lockdowns disrupted religious participations for many Americans, and concluded that uh, that. It has changed the way people go out and worship. In the summer of 2020, only 13% reported attending in-person worship services. But, you know, we were still in the the pandemic uh, of of COVID. And, of course, you had the lockdowns going on at that time. But uh, it didn't account for over over the internet worship, I think. Well, by the spring of 2022, that 13% had increased to 27%. And even though 30% of Americans reported they never attend religious services, it was clear that 27% did. Now, I don't know about your churches. I'm dealing with four churches uh, in central Illinois that I help out with. And their attendance is back up uh, to what it was even before the pandemic. So I believe that that's because the liturgy really is comforting. The sermons are long gospel sermons. The hymns are, are really tremendous and therefore people are being fed. But I can see a lot of times I'll talk to someone who's left church and I say, well, what was your church like? And after they tell me what their pastor was teaching and it wasn't a Lutheran church, I said, you know, I would have left that church also because you're not being comforted. Well, we had talked about that last year in, in several instances of, of pastors of various denominations that were not t- talking about the gospel itself, that uh, love was the way to salvation, not, 
and not mention that uh, it is the love of Christ, Christ dying on the cross for us. In fact, in what was it in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, yeah, he became sin who knew no sin. Yes. And so what we have is a situation here where many people are returning to church after the pandemic about they said almost 85% have kind of returned. And the attendance on Sunday is starting to level off from what it was in January 2020. So 85% of those people have returned. And a lot of that is because, well, they don't have mask restrictions anymore. Now, Louise and I, we always wear a mask when we go to church because we're involved with so many people with four congregations that at one of our congregations, during one week, five of them recently came down with COVID. So it's still going around, and we've been very fortunate that we haven't had it at all. But I think that's partly because we primarily wear a mask even in going to church. So they can hear you through your mask as you're doing the sermons? Well, when it comes to the sermons, because I'm far enough away, I usually then take off the mask. Because in the congregations, I, I don't have a microphone. And so I just have to raise my voice. But it's getting better in attendance at those churches that really have proper preaching and proper teaching. So that's kind of a victory that people are returning to church, but it's not at the levels that they were attending church in 2020. Well, it's a reminder, and we've often said this, Romans chapter 10, faith comes from hearing, and hearing that word of Christ. The Holy Spirit works through the word, and with the proper preaching of law and gospel, there's going to be faith rekindled, faith renewed, faith sustained. Yes, I, I listen to other radio stations, KFUO, is just wonderful in that its programs are Christ-centered and very helpful with the law and the gospel. But in many other stations, you hear pastors relentlessly talking against the sins of people, and you get the impression that, well, you may not be saved if you continue to sin. And so works become the way of salvation on many of these programs. And the fact is that people recognize in themselves that they are not able to do these good works. But it doesn't mean that everything is negative. Another article you sent me I was quite interested in. It's entitled, I Wanted to Die for Allah, Now I Live for Jesus. Now, what was that article about? Well, it was it, it was about a former Muslim who became a Christian. But what was interesting was he he grew up as a child in Saudi Arabia, and uh, he was taught that uh, Muslims were superior to all others, and non-Muslims were infidels. And of course, they believed Jesus was a prophet sent by Allah, but. He, uh, he was not the, the divine son of God. So yeah, he says, as far as I was concerned, he had never been crucified, never died on a cross, never been resurrected. I believe he had ascended into heaven, but only to be saved from his persecution before coming back at the end of times to restore Islam as the true religion of Allah. All in all, I grew up harboring intense hatred for Christians, Jews, and all who refuse Islam. In fact, by age 12, what had he memorized? 
And he had already gone about half the, the Quran, which is their holy book of, of Muhammad, of, of sayings from God. It's got 114 chapters and 6,236 verses. So he says, at age 15, I was prepared to die on behalf of Allah, like so many young people who were journeying to Afghanistan to fight the Soviet Union alongside Osama bin Laden, because he was a hero to us at that time. He says he would have joined the Holy War, but his mother pleaded with him to stay behind. But then doubts began to creep in, especially as he was reading the Quran. What kind of doubts? Well, he was seeing messages of hate within within it, messages that he couldn't understand. He wondered how God could hate his own creation simply because they did not accept him. And at some level, God should be above the kind of penny of this petty vindictiveness. You know, the Quran views God as an angry God towards towards uh, his own creation. Yes. And so he did go to college in Saudi Arabia, but went to the United States to pursue his graduate education in engineering. But he said, I had a dilemma. Islam teaches its followers not to befriend Christians. And in the Muslim world, people truly believe that the United States is a Christian nation. In other words, everyone born in America is born a Christian. So in the summer of 1989, he came to the United States filled with fear and discomfort. And I knew it was imperative to attend an American university to get the best education, but he was apprehensive because that meant having to interact with Christians. So he lived in a dormitory for about a month. But around that time, I heard something called the International Friendship Program. And what did that program do? Well, it paired students like him with local volunteers who would provide help and hospitality. And he signed up to the program not knowing it was a Christian ministry. And about two weeks later, a young couple from the program contacted him and indicated that they were uh, the family assigned to work with him. And over the next uh, seven months, the family showed that their love exceeded his expectations, a love of a sort that he never experienced among fellow Muslims. Yes. And the family invited him to their home for Thanksgiving dinner. Only then did I realize this was a Christian family, he says, because they asked if they could pray before the meal. I admit that my heart sank at that moment. I had never realized that Christians are actually filled with love and not hate, as my Muslim upbringing had led me to believe. Now, the family, he says, never had shared the gospel with me, but they had shown me what the gospel looks like. And on this day, I walked out of their home with great doubts about the Muslim faith and its teaching. I vowed that I would do research on Christianity, hoping to learn more about how Jesus could make such a profound difference in someone's life, offering the kind of peace and joy that I had never seen before. So what does this say about Christians as we welcome those who come to the United States legally as immigrants. Should we look down upon them or should we help and befriend them? Well, obviously we should help and befriend them. I think what's, what's interesting as, as we run through this case study of this fellow who became a Christian 
is God is placing these at our doorstep. They're virtually in our neighborhoods, at places we work, at places we go to school, and, and uh, showing a, a, a witness of love and kindness that, that centers in Christ makes a difference. Yes. He later said he had met another born-again Christian and asked him why he was so different from those around him. And he told me he was a born-again Christian, and he shared his testimony. Once again, I was gripped with the desire to know more about Jesus. Now, where did that desire come from, Wes? Uh well, it, it comes from hearing the word. At some point, somebody had to have shared the word with him, you know, that that uh, it develops uh, that faith within him. Yes, that desire really came from the Holy Spirit working with him. Because in May 2001, he made his first visit to a Christian church. And during the next six months, the church studied the Gospel of John, and he learned who Christ truly is. And in November, without a shadow of a doubt, he became a Christian and received Christ as his Lord and Savior. Now, it wasn't easy because he was married to a Muslim. What happened to his marriage? <laughs> well, due to unfaithfulness from his spouse, uh, they ended up in a, uh, apart, and he ended up losing his job as well. So it felt like Satan was actively trying to destroy his faith. But these months, he said, taught me invaluable lessons about having a personal relationship with Jesus and learning to depend on him through all circumstances. And during this time, God revealed his awesome glory to me in ways I could not doubt or deny. And so he says his life has changed forever. How does he explain that? Well, today he leads a global ministry and he's found by God's grace in 2010, this, this new ministry he set up. And his mission is to reach Muslims for Christ to equip believers with practical tools of sharing the gospel with Muslims. I'm, I'm familiar with it, but one that I am familiar with is Pablo International, which is out of Deerfield, to the Detroit, Michigan area, which is LCMS supported. Yes, we do have various groups. Uh, including not only to Muslims, but also to Jews. There's a congregation very close to the seminary in St. Louis that basically has former Jews who have become Christians. Now, they're still Jewish, and it's interesting, I've attended their worship services, that they still celebrate various Jewish holidays, but with a Christian emphasis. And... This Muslim, who now teaches classes and seminars at various churches so that his brothers and sisters in Christ can learn how to better witness to their Muslim neighbors. In fact, he has set up a newly established chapter of the International Friendship Program the very ministry that planted the first seeds of gospel hope in my heart almost 16 years ago. And so his name is Al-Fadi, and he teaches courses in biblical theology, business, and comparative religion at Arizona Christian University. So here's a good example. I've often said that there's nobody whom God cannot convert. And this is an example of Christians because of their lifestyle and how different they are in their hope, their peace, 
and their comfort had a reaction on this Muslim to the point where he wanted to learn more about Jesus. It, it kind of reminds us of our reading uh, for this coming Sunday when John the Baptizer's disciples uh, listen to Jesus. And what does Andrew do after he listens to Jesus? He runs away. He runs and finds his brother Peter and yes. tells him we, we, we have found him. We have found the Messiah. And that's the beginning of the ministry of Jesus after the baptism of John the Baptizer, where Jesus took upon himself our sin, died for our sin, rose from the dead, and now we follow through those same things. In baptism, Romans 6 says, we have died. We have also been raised from the dead. And I like the first chapters in Ephesians, where it says, we have also ascended to the right hand of God in Christ. So that's really the good news. This Muslim heard and became a Christian and something for all of us as Christians to do. Thanks so very much for coming again with some great articles, Wes, and we'll continue with other articles this coming next Thursday, God willing. Until then, I'm Tom Baker, Wes Reinitz. God bless you. Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check out to Law & Gospel and mail to Law & Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri 63132 or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.